Um, now, this simple idea that the electrostatics is accurately captured um, with point charges between atoms um, is, is not entirely successful. <laughs> and the reason for that is, in reality, the electrons are all spread out in space. They're smeared out, okay? So even though we knew that when we calculated the electrostatic potential and we maybe got these good RESP charges, um, it's still not true to say that the charge is then localized on the atomic centers. That's false. Uh, it's spread out in space, for, at least with respect to the electrons. So that means if I use these atom center charges, there's only so accurate I can expect it to be. Um, and um, even though I try to minimize the error in the electrostatic potential uh, by the RESP procedure, it doesn't mean that the error goes to zero. So electrostatic potentials are not quite right. Um, if I use standard approaches that most people do, um, then I don't have a way to account for the fact that the charges change if I change the conformation of the molecule. But in fact, in reality, they do because the electrons are moving, the atoms are different distances from each other. Uh, so that's normally neglected, but it shouldn't be. Um, and then um, it's also the case that the electrostatic model just looks at pairs of atoms and computes the electrostatic energy, uh, whereas if a third atom comes up, it can actually influence the distribution of charges around these two atoms and then how they interact with each other. So that's, some people would call that a three-body term or a polarization term or an induction term. And that can be 10%, 20%, depending on the situation. Um, so all of these effects are neglected in the standard electrostatic model, uh, which is simple to understand in code, but it's just not super, super accurate. So let me say a few words about how you would improve this. Uh, but uh, immediately issue the caveat that in reality, most people don't worry about this. Um, there are uh, folks who have been doing molecular modeling for decades who uh, are very used to the idea of atom-centered charges and electrostatics with Coulomb's law, and uh, they think that's awesome, and let's just do that because they've been doing it for 30 years, and it's, it's pretty cool. Um, However, if you wanted more reliable results, um, then you might need to do something else. So there's not a lot of software that goes beyond atom center point charges, but there are a few individuals who have been trying to develop theoretical methods and algorithms and software that would let you go one more level in accuracy and account for some of these things. Um, so, what could you do? Well, there's lots of things, but let me mention, you could put charges in other locations besides the atom centers, okay? So, for example, maybe I have a lone pair in water, say, and maybe instead of pretending all the uh, charges are on the oxygen and the two hydrogens, maybe I say, you know what, there's a little bit of negative charge due to those lone pairs, and I'm going to assign some center of charge that's negative for the two lone pairs. You could do that and you'll get a little bit more accurate model if you do that. You could also say life is not only about charges. You could have point dipoles or point quadrupoles. Now a dipole is just um, a, an uneven distribution of charge where I, I have um, uh, sort of a, a difference uh, as I go from one direction to another direction um, in uh, along one axis, okay? Um, and a quadrupole is where then I could have sort of four kind of different uh, locations to think about the charge. And you could go higher and higher and higher. Um, so either of these approaches or both of these approaches could potentially give you a little bit more accuracy. Uh, and uh, one example of this would be Anthony Stone's distributed multipole analysis, um, which uh, is a way to um, 
figure out where to put in point charges, but also point dipoles and point quadrupoles, etc. Um, if you just did this, it still doesn't necessarily solve the problem that these values might change as a molecule rotates and vibrates. So that's a separate dimension uh, to this. If you wanted to worry about that other problem of how did the charges change or the multipoles change if I change the geometry of the molecule, then uh, you could use what's called a polarizable force field model, uh, which takes into account changes in the electron distribution of the atoms as the molecule uh, changes conformation or as other molecules come up to it. One way to do that, one of the simpler ways to do polarizable force fields, is the so-called fluctuating charge model. So let me say a couple words about the fluctuating charge model just to give you a taste. I'll show some equations, but we won't get into the nitty-gritty of them. Uh, let's start off with this idea in equation 14 that the energy uh, is uh, some baseline energy, E0, plus this sort of Taylor-like series where um, I'm expanding in delta n, where n is the number of electrons. And this may seem like a weird idea, because you might say, well, don't I know how many electrons a molecule has? Isn't that a fixed constant? Well, yes and no. You can imagine a water molecule, and then another water molecule comes up to it, and maybe there's a little bit of charge transfer from one water molecule to the next, depending on which way they're oriented towards each other. Maybe if an oxygen comes up near a hydrogen, it donates a fraction of a charge towards it. That could happen. And so then it does make sense to say, well, if I do lose a little of my charge from one molecule to another, how does my energy change? Obviously, it will affect the energy. And you could try a Taylor series, like equation 14. The electronegativity can be associated with uh, delta E delta N. Um, and uh, the so-called chemical hardness eta can be associated with that second derivative term. Uh, and then accounting for the fact that we're talking about chart moving electrons, and electrons have a negative charge, we'll set delta Q equals delta N uh, times negative 1. And then we'll rewrite equation 14 and get equation 15, uh, which is similar in concept. Um, then what you could do is you could say, well, the electrostatic energy only depends on the external potential, uh, phi, and then if I sum up or over all the sites, then I get that the electrostatic energy depends on all the charges in the molecule, QA, times the electrostatic potential they feel, uh, plus these derivative terms, um, all the charges QA multiplied by um, chi A's um, and uh, electronegativities, uh, and then uh, the product of the charges times these chemical hardnesses. Then you want to apply a variational principle and minimize the energy with respect to the charges, uh, both with uh, external potential uh, and without. So phi not equal to zero in equation 17 and phi equal to zero in equation 18. And uh, glossing over the details, you get kind of a simple looking equation that tells you what the change, delta, in the charges is on the molecules, on the atoms, delta Q, and it's just equal to however big the external potential is, phi, times uh, negative the inverse of this chemical hardness. And that you could solve, and of course you have to solve it self-consistently because the uh, potential phi depends on the charges, so I need uh, the charge is Q to get phi, but I need phi to get how the charge has changed, delta Q. So I've got to sol solve it all self-consistently. Um, and, uh, and the potential we've already seen, if I'm assuming atom-centered point charge model, which I am for this fluctuating charge model, then that's just equation 20. Okay, so that uh, at a hand-wavy level and a brief level tells you how you could start from something like equation 20 if I guess the charges, get some potentials, go back to equation 19 uh, and solve for how the charges change, and then allows that allows charge to hop between sites uh, in the simulation, 
And then that is good because that allows the charges to respond to the local chemical environment. And that's called the fluctuating charge model. Lots of other polarizable models, usually more complicated than what I just talked about, uh, but they uh, exist. Uh, and uh, they're not super popular at the moment because the computational cost of calculating where all these charges move if I move the atoms around is um, significant. And so it slows down the calculation quite a lot. And that means you can't use it on systems that are as big or you can't run your simulation as long, which is a drawback. But if you can afford it, it gives you some additional accuracy, which is the benefit. Um, I'll briefly mention there are, are other polarizable models out there. Um, uh, some other models incorporate some explicit terms that you might call polarization terms. Um, so for example, um, uh, at some atom I could create some atomic uh, dipole moment where the electrons sort of shift uh, in some particular direction in response to the electrostatic potential uh, or the electric field. The electric field is just the derivative of the potential with respect to R. Um, so equation 21 tells me if I have some electric field F, then that can induce a local dipole moment. Uh, often we look at each atom and say an atomic dipole moment. Uh, and it's just how strong is the electric field at that atom F times uh, atomic polarizability alpha. And then the energy associated with creating that dipole is just how big that induced dipole is, uh, mu induced, times the electric field F divided by two to avoid double counting. And because mu induced is alpha F, that is also equal to one half alpha F squared. So a lot of times we do something like this and we'll take the molecular polarizability, which is easier to compute or, or get by experiment, and somehow find a mechanism to break that up into atomic polarizabilities, which again is not a super well-defined uh, uh, procedure, but there are ways to define that. Okay, that was a bit of a diversion into all the different nuances of the electrostatics and possible accounting for uh, polarization.